One of the biggest pet peeves that I have in the life insurance industry is people A, buying based on assumptions on illustrations and B, life insurance agents relying on illustrations to actually sell a product. Now, the reality is um, illustrations, the one of guarantee that happens on both whole life and IULs is the, the illustration, illustrations are never gonna perform exactly like you see. Uh, there are all sorts of variables. I have a list of different areas uh, that impact the illustrations, impact the actual performance, and ultimately I want to explain why all these areas are reasons that you should never rely exactly on the illustration and that you need to understand conceptually why you're doing what you're doing and if you can make sense and if it makes sense to buy it conceptually or sell it conceptually without anybody ever looking at an illustration, then and only then should you buy or sell that product. So let me know if you have any questions as you go through this, comment in the comment section below. If you haven't already, subscribe, hit the bell, that way you're notified every time I launch a new video, and I uh, look forward to seeing you in there. What's going on, cash flow hackers? It's Chris with Life 180, and for this video, we are doing what I just told you. We are gonna go over why you should never rely on illustrations, whether you're buying a policy or whether you're selling a policy, you should never rely exactly on the illustration. And I would, I would make a call to action for all of your, all the life insurance agents out there who follow this channel, who try to learn and who are trying to go out there and sell people life insurance and try to serve people. Hopefully, if you're watching this channel, hopefully your mindset is serving, adding value into people's lives. And you know, you do that, you're gonna sell more policies, I think. However, I think a lot of people lean too much on selling based on an illustration, based on the ledger, based on uh, you know, just, just um, I guess, random numbers uh, that, that ultimately are never really gonna come to fruition. Now, there are elements uh, that I'm gonna get into in all this with whole life variances between whole life and IUL. You can see back here, I have a list of things that I just kinda wanna touch on case by case by case, and uh, we'll go from there. So, first and foremost, loan rates, okay? Think about it this way, with uh, with whole life insurance, every company can um, illustrate completely differently. I could do uh, policies with every major mutual company out there and every company is gonna illustrate a little bit differently. The problem is not all things are created equal, meaning when I, when I look at an illustration, uh, one illustration company may look better than another, but it only looks better if I never touch it or if it performs a certain way or, uh, you know, and I'm gonna get into the dividend rate next on how um, that can be misleading. Um, but let's just talk about loan rates for a second. You know, let's, let's take two companies. Um, I'm not gonna give specific companies in this. Let's just take company A and company B. If you have one company that maybe outperforms um, another by 10%, let's just, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull this over and I'll do this. So you got company A, right? And then you got company B. And so company A is 10% better, right? The company B is negative 10%. But then this is a uh, performance. I'll just write performance. And, and that is what it is. And, and so if we have that performance, um, I should do that. Performance is 10% better here. 10% worse here, and that's fine. But let's just say the loan rate is, let's call it 4% here, and, uh, or actually, my bad, um, is 4% here, and maybe 5.5% here, right? So not all things are created equal, because what happens is when you start to actually leverage the policy, you have to really figure out what's best for you. How do you plan on utilizing this policy? And if you don't understand all the variables, it, it's not, not all things are equal because the bottom line is when you look at a policy, what I wanna do is I wanna show, I wanna show this real quick. I wanna, I wanna take time and go through this and use this in, as an example when we talk about loan rates and the impact, right? So this is a company, I'm not gonna show two companies uh, against each other in this situation, but what I do wanna do is show you exactly what I'm talking about. So in this situation, you got $110,000 that you put in year one, you got 101,000. Now, let's just say this goes down and you can see by the time uh, we hit here in year 10, you've put in 200,000, you've contributed 200,000 in premiums, year 10, right here. 
200,000 in premiums and you got $227,000 of value. Now, another policy um, may have it so it only shows in, in here, let's just say policy B, I'm gonna just make something up. Let's just say policy B only has 210,000, right? Of cash value, right? So if you were to compare the two together, well, in a bubble, in a vacuum, it would look like, all right, this one is better than this one. And so for this context, this example, what I wanna talk about is, is the loan rate. So what if in this policy, we're talking about the loan rate is 5.5% and the loan rate over here is only 4% in option B, in the, in the second option, right? So when we look at this and we compare those two together, you know, maybe this policy is as good as it uh, is better than option B if you were to never touch it. But the bottom line is, if you're getting a policy like this, it's not really worth doing unless you're going to touch it. So you really have to think about like, how's it going to perform all in after how you plan to utilize it. So when people ask me, Chris, what's the best company? What's the best policy? What's the best policy design? My answer is all, always sounds evasive. It's not meant to be evasive. It's always, well, it depends on how you plan to use it. And it depends on what your goals and objectives are. And are you designing a policy to fit your goals and your wants and your desires, right? And so when you break this down, I could show and make a really, really strong cause uh, argument to show that even though this performs a little less good, because when you think about like the compounding over time, $17,000 over 10 years is not that much. But then when you look at the difference in the loan cost, that is a significant difference. And I'm going to tell you, I'm not naming the companies, but this is basically um, a pretty much a real comparison between two different companies to consider and to contemplate, right? So when you look at that, you go, okay, um, that's one reason that uh, not all illustrations should matter because like it's not apples to apples and you have to really take that into consideration. So loan rates is something to consider. Now gross versus net dividend rates. Now here's the deal. I could take, I don't wanna go back to that illustration. I'm gonna just write all over the place here. So I could take um, one, uh, I could take a company that I, I'll take company A for dividend rates. And I could take, uh, here, I gotta just write this a little differently. I could take company A, um, I'll take company A and I'll take company B, right, for dividend rates. And, and company A might have a 6% dividend rate and company B might have a 5% dividend rate, right? So naturally, a lot of agents are selling on the idea of like, hey, dividends are 6% over here, so why would you go with that? versus this. Well, what they don't tell you is, you know, you can't draw blood from a rock. You actually have to look at the dividend rates. You got to look at the loan rates. You got to look at how all the moving parts in the policy are going to affect the end desire and the end goal for what you're after. But here's the deal. You have to look at how are dividend rates actually produced? How, how is the dividend actually not produced? How is the dividend rate produced is one thing, but how is the dividend um, actually paid out? That's what really matters, right? So when you see a company pay out, what they do is they have um, the profitability of the company. So they have a dividend scale. This, this 6% is not a net number, right? That's a gross number. That meaning, meaning that's uh, what they say they're gonna pay before expenses and all these different things. And let me explain that a little deeper and what I mean because it's a little bit complicated. So for instance, let's say a company has, um, I don't know, uh, uh, just for the sake of it, 100 million you know, of, of uh, potential dividend payout, right? That, that's their potential revenue, right? And, and I know this is a really small number for most of these companies, but I just, I want a round number that's big enough, but that makes sense that we can work with. So if you have $100 million of, of revenue, that, and, and maybe they said, hey, we're gonna pay a 6% dividend, right? So most people would look at that and go, oh, 6% revenue, they're gonna pay that 6% dividend, so that's $6 million, right? But the bottom line is that's not how it works. What happens is, they go this hundred million and they say, okay, we're, we got a hundred million that we're, we're going to pay 6%. But the bottom line is that 6% is a net number after all expenses and, 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 and costs of running the business, right? So they can always, um, take mortality charges and then expenses to run the business. I'll just write expenses. And, and they will subtract those off to get whatever number it is. And so, yeah, will they pay 6% on whatever number that is? The 
The answer is yes. But the bottom line is these numbers can be changed no matter what. So there's not a lot of transparency in what that is and how a company operates from an efficiency perspective is going to have an impact. It's not a clear apples to apples. And that's why there are some companies, one of the companies that I love, um, once again, I'm not going to name it right now because I, I keep getting in trouble for naming out companies on, on these calls or on these videos. Um, but one of the things that I, I love is that they're not playing the game. They actually say, we're not gonna, we're not gonna call this out. What we're gonna do is we're gonna give you a guarantee, You're right, right? They're gonna pick a guarantee and they're gonna give a good guarantee, a really solid guarantee. And then they're gonna say, listen, above and beyond that, you're partnered with us. We're gonna pay you a dividend. We're gonna pay it every year, but we're not gonna play these games about what dividend rate we're gonna declare. We're, we're gonna absolutely declare a dividend at the end of the year. But remember, when you look at any of these companies, I don't care what it is, they don't declare and say, yeah, we hit our 6% number. They declare and say, hey, we paid out 100 whatever million, or we paid out whatever amount, they give an amount of the number of the dividend that they paid out to their policyholders in total, right? So when you look at it from that perspective, you realize the percentage is, is, is kind of a bit smoke and mirrors. And so the, the thing that I don't like is when people are selling based on these dividend numbers, like there's some huge advantage to the other. And when you take loan rates into account, and then you take in the fact that, you know, what really matters is the net dividend after all expenses, that's what matters, but they market the gross dividend and you really have to look at the bigger picture if you're taking that into consideration. Now, the other thing is direct versus non-direct. I could look at this illustration, unless I know if it's a direct versus non-direct company, it really doesn't matter, right? If this is a direct recognition company, what means is as I take a loan from this, if I take a loan of, let's say, because I have 101,000, let's say I have access, I want to take an $80,000 loan, right? Here, what a, a, a direct recognition says, it's going to directly, directly recognize this $80,000 loan, right? And what does that mean? It means it's going to reduce, it's going to directly impact the dividend for the equivalent that the loan is out on. A non-direct recognition company means it's not going to recognize this loan, It's it, meaning it's not going to have an impact on the dividend, which therefore this will grow no matter whether you take loans or not. This policy is going to grow however it's going to grow. Now, once again, this is based on current assumptions. I'm always telling people what you want to do is you want to look at the guarantees, right? Period. There's always a guaranteed side and a non-guaranteed side. Everybody likes to sell on the non-guaranteed side. I think the way to do it is look at the guaranteed side because that's I'm a big believer. What's the upside? What's the downside? Can I live with the downside? This is going to be your worst case scenario. And I honestly don't think you're ever going to have to rely on that because these companies have paid a dividend for over 120 years consecutively, never missing a year. And so obviously this is assuming the guaranteed side is assuming they never paid a dividend above and beyond the guarantee. Um, you know, so that said, I would say um, there's also a lot of good things happening in the economy right now that would lend me to have confidence that the performance of these policies in an increasing interest rate environment are going to get better, right? I would say that for whole life, not for IUL. However, um, you know, it is what it is. Like, I would say conservatively, uh, the truth is going to be, you know, if we looked at year 15, it's 197,000 on the guaranteed, which is obviously low, 325 here, which is, uh, which is actually pretty decent. The truth is going to be probably more leaning towards this being accurate, but there's a chance it could be less. And in fact, it could actually be higher than this. Potentially, the one thing I know is it won't be that exactly. That's the one thing I know. 15 years from now, this policy, even in a whole life policy that are super so strong and stable and financial fortresses, and they've been financial institutions for 180 years that have been better than any other financial institution in the world, I believe all that, and that's true, and I still will tell you this policy would not have $325,608 at year 15. It may be more, it may be a little less, but it won't be exactly that. Now, with a non-direct recognition company, I'm just saying it's not going to impact the growth. With a direct recognition company, if you know you're going to actively utilize these policies for loans, it will have a negative impact. And so you need to understand that that comes into play. And so once again, that's why just relying on the illustration and relying on the ledger is a mistake. And so that then knocks out the whole life conversation. Now, let's get into just IUL because I know I got a lot of people that watch both. Now, here's the deal. 
when I look at um, Index Universal Life and we talk about um, this is that there are internal charges that are not shown in the ledger of the illustration, right? Like, and there, there is a, a charges and expense um, portion of the illustration, right? And so if you look at the page, right, it's gonna have a page and you're gonna have all the ledger, right? You're gonna have all the ledgers numbers and you'll have the percentage up here that you're based on the assumption or whatever. And you'll have all the charges uh, listed out. You'll have all the, you know, all the different charges and IUL agents like to tell you that, you know, this is what makes them more transparent because they tell you what all the charges and the fees are. But really what matters is up in the corner, there's a little asterisk saying uh, that these charges are um, not guaranteed, right? They, these charges are uh, subject to change at um, the carrier's will. Right. And so these internal charges um, will have an impact on the IUL. Now, down here, I wrote net amount at risk. I want to I want to skip ahead because this and I'll come back. The net amount at risk here is what matters the most, because when you look at the ledger in a whole life policy, that's fixed and that's guaranteed. And the charges are are balanced out and leveraged out over a longer period of time. Um, and they're 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 level. They're even every year. With IUL, it's annual renewable term. They IUL agents speak out of both sides of their mouth and they say, hey, you're gonna, you're gonna have a, a net amount at risk, which is what your insurance costs are based off are gonna shrink. But the bottom line is then they go sell you option B, which is increasing death benefit. So by the time you hit retirement, you still have all this insurance and net amount at risk hasn't gone down. In fact, it's actually probably increased because of the bottom line is you've you've got this increasing death benefit. So the um, the the cash value goes up as the cash value goes up so does the death benefit so what happens is this death benefit goes up but then what happens is when internal charges get increased and that hurts the policy when we have flat years when cap rates get reduced when spread charges get increased when participation rates get reduced right so i'm going to kind of knock this out at the same time here what happens is the cash value goes down but the death benefit still stays Right. So what happens is you have a net amount at risk that increases and the spread gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So what happens then is your annual renewable term goes, the charge goes higher and higher. And so then as you age, as your age goes up, your net amount at risk spread is also going up and your annual renewable term costs go up. And so this is how in an illustration, when we talk about compounding, the costs and the fees and all this stuff compounds against you. And so you cannot look at any illustration. This is what I just wanted to say. When you look at a whole life, I don't care if you're looking at these three things for whole life or all of the above, but especially these three things for IUL and you take it into consideration. This is the reason you should never look or you should never purchase or sell a policy, period solely based on the illustration. If you cannot explain to your client or if you as a client do not understand this stuff before you buy, you're gonna get what you get. Like, and, and, and I believe, I always tell people, the reason I love a properly designed whole life insurance policy when done and leveraged properly in your life is because it's the only financial tool in the world that will force you to become who you need to become to get to where you wanna be, right, in your life. And so that said, this is an educational journey, right? Like don't just buy based on the ledger, buy based on the fact that we have all these things going on. You're buying for control, you're buying for guarantees, you're buying for opportunity, you're buying to preserve the purchasing power of your capital. That's the one thing life insurance companies do better. I would look at the guarantee first and, and say, can I live with that? Can I live with that? Or maybe find the guarantee, find this, find the happy medium ground, like the, you know, the, the split point. You know, I got 325 here, I got 197 there. You know, that's $125,000 difference. So, you know, if this were 250, you know, and if that's the worst case kind of that I would live with, am I comfortable with that? I would look at a whole life policy and that's kind of how I would look at it. Um, and if the answer is no, then you need to find a company with a better guarantee. Don't get sucked into the current assumptions or some companies that are playing this illustration war, even in the whole life game, where they look better than they are. I know it's sexy, I know it's easy to sell, but I encourage every agent out there to become who you need to become to actually serve your clients better and understand this stuff so you can actually go out and have a real authentic conversation to help them solve their problems. So anyway, that is it for this video. I hope it makes sense. If you have any questions, comment in the comment section below. If you 
need anything, if you're looking at this, if you want a policy overview, reach out to my team down in the description. There's a link to set up a free clarity call. We're happy to help you in any way possible. If you're an agent looking to grow in this and you want to learn and you know join an organization that can help you do it, reach out. There's a link down below. And for, for people looking to implement a policy in your own life, same thing for you. So that is it. If you're watching this video, please give me, give me like an emoji, just an emoji in the comment because I'm trying to see how many people are watching these videos this long. I, I'm really looking to get some feedback. I'm kind of running a test study. So if you could just drop an emoji in the comments, curious to see what that looks like, like a thumbs up or like a star or something fun like that. Um, or maybe a thumbs down if you don't like me, I don't know, but hopefully there's not too many of those. Um, so anyway, that is it. Hopefully you found value in this. Have a blessed inspirational day. We'll talk soon.